lovely is dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. My soul longs to live and faint for you. Hear my heart to satisfy within your presence. Sing beneath the shadow of the wind. Better is one day in your coat. Better is one day in your house, better is one day in your coat, thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your coat, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your coat, thousands elsewhere. Thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your coat. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your coat. Thousands elsewhere. My heart, my heart and flesh cry out for you, the living God. Your spirit's water for my soul. I've tasted and I've seen Come once again to me I will draw near to you I will draw near to you Better is one day in your coats Better is one day in your house Better is one day in your coats Thousands elsewhere Better is one day in your coach, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your coach, thousands elsewhere, thousands elsewhere. The last song was actually based on the psalm by David, where David says, it is a joy to be in God's presence. You know, God's presence, he wants to abide in God's Being a king and being so busy, he still wanted to be in the presence of God. He still wanted to be in the unhindered presence of God. That teaches us a big lesson. In all our busyness, we go away from God. We give the least importance to God's things. We give the least importance to studying the Word of God, to reading the Word, to prayer. You know? So, 
that shows us that we don't long to live in god's presence we don't long and desire to be in his presence we would say a thousand days elsewhere is far better than being in the presence of god because we are we have our eyes fixed on the world and the things that the world has to offer but when we come into his presence we have to abide in his presence it is like the shadow of your wings be under his presence be in his presence forever why when you go out of his presence that is when you have all your troubles beginning so be choose to remain under the wings of the almighty you oh lord are my refuge you are holy and just you are faithful and righteous you oh lord are my refuge by your mercy you cover me under the shadow of your wing Lord in your presence I'll remain you are forever more the same you are my refuge my only refuge Lord, I'm my refuge. In you I find rest. You're my God and my fortress. You, oh Lord, I'm my refuge. By your mercy, you cover me under the shadow of your wing. Lord, in your presence I remain. You are forever more the same. You are my refuge, my only refuge. You, O oh Lord, are my refuge. It is You I will trust. You're my light in the dark. You, O oh Lord, are my refuge. By Your mercy, You cover me. Under the shadow of your wings, Lord, in your presence I'll remain. You are forever more the same. You are my refuge, my only refuge. You are my refuge. my only refuge let's pray father teach us how to draw into the presence of the king and to remain there oh lord father to desire to be in your presence always help us to have this as the only priority of our lives to desire to be that one day in your presence is better than a thousand elsewhere oh lord help us to choose to be in your presence studying your word hearing your voice speak to our hearts help us oh lord to desire that with all our hearts in jesus precious name we pray amen All right so good evening and welcome to you only right so let's continue where we left off it is in John chapter 12 John chapter 12 let me just share the screen so that we can see what we are studying All right. John chapter 12 and verses 27 to 50 is what we are going to read. Okay, John chapter 12 verses 27 to 50. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. 
I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it was thunder it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus answered this voice has come for your sake not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out and I when I am lifted up from the earth will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So the crowd answered him we have heard from the law that the christ remains forever how can you say that the son of man must be lifted up who is the son of man so jesus said to them the light is among you for a little while longer while walk while you have the light lest darkness overtake you the one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going while you have the light believe in the light that you may become sons of light When Jesus had said these things he departed and hid himself from them though he had done so many signs before them they still did not believe in him so that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled Lord who has believed what he heard from us and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed therefore they could not believe for Isaiah again Isaiah said he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn and i would heal them isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him nevertheless many even of the authorities believed in him but for fear of the pharisees they did not confess it so that they would not be put out of the synagogue for they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from god and jesus cried out and said whoever believes in me believes not in me but in him who sent me and whoever sees me sees him who sent me i have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness if anyone hears my words and does not keep them i do not judge him for i did not come to judge the world but to save the world the one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge and the word that i have spoken will judge him on the last day for i have not spoken on my own authority but the father who sent me has himself given me a commandment what to say and what to speak and i know that his commandment is eternal life what i say therefore i say as the father has told me all right so a beautiful passage which actually talks about why the son of man should be lifted up and it also talks about the unbelief of the jews so this evening we're going to focus on the jesus and the unbelieving jews Okay now the first thing that he does is he prays you know last week we saw the meeting with the greeks and soon after that this event is happening so here jesus says should my soul be troubled now he was disturbed but at the same time he says uh, should i pray you no know, father save me from this hour but he says no i have come for this very i have come to die on the cross i have come for this particular hour this is my time see so I cannot pray you know save me from the czar because that is not the, my purpose that's not the purpose for which I came see so when he said this father glorify thy name a voice a reply came from heaven god the father spoke to god his son and gave him a double assurance what does he say i have glorified I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. See. So this was a double assurance that the father was giving him. And we saw that the son's past life, 33 years of his life, 30 years he was living obediently in the, in the house of Joseph and Mary along with his brothers and sisters, that life and the 3 year a half years of ministry that he has done that had glorified the father every moment of that life had glorified the father and the son's future suffering and death that is also his death on the cross is also going to glorify the father see so the father gives a double assurance to the son now has the father spoken to jesus before in an audible voice that others could also hear yes the father has spoken to jesus earlier also 
we saw at the baptism of Jesus, Matthew chapter 3 and verse 17. That was the beginning of Jesus' ministry. See? At that point of time, Matthew chapter 3 verse 17 tells us that when Jesus came out of the waters of baptism, the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove and there was a voice from heaven. It says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So in the beginning of his ministry, there we heard the father speak about the son. And then we see him on the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew chapter 17 and verse 5. That was the time when Jesus was going to start his journey towards Jerusalem for the last final uh, you know, uh, week when he would be crucified on the cross. When he began his journey from the Mount of Transfiguration, on the Mount itself, we heard the Father speak about the Son. This is my beloved Son. Listen to him, he said. See? So, two times already the Father has attested about the Son by speaking audibly. And here, also, when he entered into the last week, the last few days before the cross, again, the Father speaks about him. See? Now, when we go through struggles, when we suffer, God's word speaks to us. You know, God's word gives assurance when you and I go through suffering for his name's sake. When we suffer because we are Christians, when we suffer for the name of the, for the sake of the gospel, when you and I suffer, God gives us assurance through the word of God. He said, don't lose heart, though I am with you always. See, God always gives that word of assurance to those who willingly suffer for his name's sake and for the sake of the gospel. Now the Bible says, the people heard a sound, but they did not understand the message. They did not know what is the message that was conveyed. But still Jesus says, this message was spoken not for me. See, what did the crowd say? The crowd stood there and heard it and said it was, it was like thundered. You know, it was like a th sound of thunder. Imagine that yesterday it was thundering. You know, I didn't know it was thundering for a long time when Nisa told me only. She said, uh, okay, that was thunder actually. Said, oh, it's going to rain? So, sometimes, you know, uh, people shouting with sounds like thunder or, you know, thundering voices when people speak. Sometimes we, sometimes the microphone is not working properly. Then also we think that, you know, it's like sound of thunder. But here, some, because the sound was like thunder, many people did not understand or grasp what was being spoken. See? But Jesus says, uh, somebody said, you know, an angel had spoken to him. So they knew that it was something divine, but they didn't know what was the content of the message. And Jesus answered and says, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. See? So this voice was given for your sake. Now, if people heard the sound and did not know the message, how did it benefit them? See, if the voice was for, for their sake and they did not understand it, what good was it? Now, if Jesus was losing confidence, the voice came to give assurance to Jesus to go to the cross. The Father is with you. See? So, Jesus was encouraged by the voice he heard. So, he continued his journey to the cross. In that way, it benefited us, you see. So, if the voice has assured Jesus who was to die for our sake, then the voice is for our good. See? They heard him pray and they heard the sound from heaven in response to that prayer. So, they knew for certain, they were convinced that Jesus was in touch with heaven. Jesus was in touch with the Father. See, That voice came more for your sake than for mine. That's what Jesus said. John 12 verse 30. The voice came for your sake more than for me. So, the, as soon as Jesus prayed, the thunder from heaven came. So, which means as an answer to, as a response to his prayer, the sound came, which helped them to be convinced that Jesus was in touch with the Father. See, what did he say? Father glorify. And suddenly the Father responded. See? So it was the Father and Son's closeness, association with each other, the bond that they share, that that was, uh, that was uh, these people could be convinced of that. See? Now, how did this, how did this change his 
acceleration towards the cross. From this time, he started teaching more aggressively about his death on the cross. You know, more aggressively on the on the on the cross. Jesus says it is the hour of judgment for the world and for Satan. It is the hour of judgment for the world and for Satan. Who is Satan? Satan is the prince of the world. It says, now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, who, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. See, So the ruler of this world, Satan, the prince of the world, is going to be judged. Now, the death of Jesus Christ, you know, at that point of time would seem like Satan was victorious. You know, But it would really be a judgment on the world. It would look like the world has triumphed by putting Jesus to the cross. His mission was cut short. He was martyred. So it means his mission was abruptly ended. No. That was the whole point. Satan was very much confused about the cross. He didn't know whether to send Jesus to the cross or to prevent him from going to the cross. He tried to influence Paul, Peter, you know, to discourage him from going to the cross. And uh, Peter, when he said that, Jesus said, get thee behind me. So Jesus was going to the cross. He was determined on that. Satan did not know whether to send him to the cross or to keep him from the cross. He was confused on that. But then he did make the people say, you know, crucify him, crucify him. And he did go to the cross. So once he was on the cross, Satan thought he was triumphant. But it was actually his judgment. See, it was a judgment upon him and it was a judgment upon the world. On that cross, Satan would defeat, Satan would be defeated by Jesus and Satan's head would be crushed. It would be crushed. See, Jesus would not only defeat Satan, he would also defeat the world system that Satan has established. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So the grip that the world had upon you has been taken off. The clutches of the world upon your life has been loosened and you have been set free. When did this happen? On the cross. When Jesus defeated the world system and Satan. So you would say, so is Satan finished? No. He is now permitted to go to and fro on the earth, but he is a defeated foe. See? As a defeated foe, he is granted some rights, but he is, his power, his grip on the world system is gone. The world system's grip on your life is gone. His clutches in your life has been cast off. He is a defeated foe. So as we serve the Lord, what do we? what is our role there? We have to overcome the wicked one. See, when we serve the Lord, we automatically overcome the evil one. Every time we serve the Lord, we overcome Satan's grip in our life. Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, verse 17 to 19. Luke chapter 10, verses 17 to 19. The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. You see, Satan can't hurt you anymore. The world cannot put its grip on you again anymore. Why? Because Jesus said, I have defeated both those the, the power of the world and the influence of Satan in your life. See, he's a defeated foe. Now you can't keep on saying, you know, I'm subject to Satan now, you know, I have to sin. No. You have been set free. You have been set free. So Satan is a defeated enemy. And as we keep on serving the Lord, we overcome the wicked one. Now one day, Satan is going to be completely cast out from heaven also. Right? Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10. It says, 
and i heard a loud voice in heaven saying now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our god sorry uh, 12 verse 10 yeah uh, kingdom of our god and the authority of the christ have come for the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our god satan will be cast out of heaven and eventually he is going to be judged and imprisoned forever okay revelation chapter 20 verse 10 tells us that satan is going to be cast into the lake of fire forever he is not going to be the ruler of the lake of fire he is going to be a victim there and he is going to be there forever and ever so satan is a defeated for we have no excuse to keep on saying i am under the power of sin i am under the power of satan i am under the grip of the world no no more jesus says satan is a defeated for the world has been the wicked world has been defeated the power of the world upon your life has been loosened now jesus says when sorry when i am lifted up he says sorry in the wrong book he says and i when i am lifted up from the earth will draw all people to myself now this world word uh, lifted up actually comes earlier also john chapter 3 and verse 14 john chapter 3 and verse 14 john chapter 3 was and as moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness so must the son of man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life okay the phrase lifted up means crucifixion okay john chapter 12 and verse 33 is where we read that It says he said to show that show by what kind of death he was going to die what kind of death was he going to die he was going to die by crucifixion so lifted up which means crucifixion but the word also carries it with it the idea of glorification see glorification isaiah chapter 52 and verse 13 says behold my servant will prosper he will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted he will be glorified see so crucifixion also means he is going to be glorified so the son of man was glorified by being crucified okay now we should understand that crucifixion was something of a heinous capital punishment it was a shameful final you know uh, 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 judgment on a person okay according to the roman law so it was shameful for a person to carry the cross and to die you know in public display like that naked on the hanging on the cross but that is going to be his glorification okay so the crucifixion his death on the cross is where the son of man is going to be glorified all right now when jesus says i will draw all men to myself when he says all men it does not mean universal salvation it does not mean that it means all people without any distinction which means there is not going to be any sorting out okay this people will be saved that people will be saved no all people without distinction that means jews as well as gentiles okay jews and gentiles both are going to be saved there is not going to be any distinction between the jews and gentiles god does not show favoritism both jews and gentiles will be saved so when he is lifted up when he is put on the cross he is going to be glorified and when that happens he is going to draw both jews and gentiles unto himself it does not mean universal salvation but it means all people without distinction now now when you when you read this passage we should understand that jesus is not going to force anybody to to draw near to him okay he draws them he attracts them he he pulls them towards himself but then what happens he said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die so the crowd answered okay he says uh he draws us and then the people 
might find the way to be saved. Verse 32. And when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. See, the people will find the way towards him when he is lifted up. And then the people might be, might know the truth. And then the people might receive their true life that God wants to offer. So lifting up has this purpose that people would be drawn towards him. They'll be attracted towards him. They would find the way to come to Jesus and they would know the truth and they would receive the life. John chapter 8 and verse 28. John chapter 8 verse 28. So Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the son of man, this is cross, okay? lift up the son of man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the father taught me. You will know that I am he. They will know the truth. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Son of God. When Jesus is lifted up on the cross, see, man, remember that uh, Roman centurion who stood at the foot of the cross, he also said, this must surely be the Son of God. See. And receive the life. John chapter 3, verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so was, must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Okay, so this is what Jesus is saying. He's not going to force anybody to come towards him, but people will see the way who Jesus really is and then they will be attracted towards, they will come towards him and they will know the truth and they will receive the life. Now, did the people understand? No. The people did not understand what he was teaching. Now, they knew that the Son of Man is a title for the Messiah. Okay? But they did not understand why the Messiah would be crucified. See, if, if the Messiah is going to come, then their idea, their concept uh, from the Old Testament was that they thought the Son of Man would come and he would take up the throne, he would defeat the Romans and he would establish his empire, the golden age of Israel. That is what would happen. So when Jesus said that he was going to, he was the Son of Man, he was going to the cross, they don't understand which son of man is this? Who is he talking about? That's not the Messiah. They have been conditioned to think in a different way and Jesus was completely saying something contrary to what they were taught. You see, what they understood, what they thought the Messiah was. So it was a misunderstanding on their part because they did not understand the Old Testament. See, they knew that the son of man was the title of the Messiah, but they could not understand why the Messiah would be crucified. So they were asking this question. Does not the Old Testament claim that, you know, the uh, the Son of Man is going to live forever? He's not going to die. He can't be killed, can he? Psalm 72 and verse 17. Psalm 72 and verse 17. May his name endure forever. His fame continue as long as the sun. May people be blessed in him. All nations call him blessed. See? Doesn't this psalm talk about the son of man living forever and ever? No. How could it be? How could it be that the Messiah who is going to live forever and ever could die on the cross? That's not what the Old Testament teaches, is it? No. Psalm 89 and verse 36. His offspring shall endure forever. His throne as long as the sun as, uh, shall endure forever. His throne as long as the sun before me. see, So things are going to go forever and the Son of Man is definitely going to go forever and ever, right? He can't be dying, is it? That's how the Old Testament teaches, isn't it? So that is the that's the wrong theology that they had. See, Jesus did not say that he's going to end on the cross. He just said that he's going to die on the cross. He's going to rise up and then he's going to live forever and ever. But this was not the time for correcting their finer points of theology. Right? This was an hour of crisis. Verse 31, now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of the world uh, you know, uh, be cast out. So this was a time of crisis. Now the Greek word crisis, K-R-I-S-I-S, also means judgment. <laughs> so, but just like this was a time of judgment, 
it is also a time of opportunity that's what jesus wanted them to know see the light was shining so brightly that was jesus okay the light was shining so brightly and they had to take advantage of this opportunity and be saved see so it was like you have to take a step of faith now and then you can pass from spiritual darkness into the light of salvation see so jesus was giving them an opportunity to put their trust in him and be saved so just like it was a time of judgment for the satan and the world it was an opportunity being given to the people to believe in him and be saved see so what did how did the people respond the light is among you jesus said for a little while longer walk while you have the light lest the darkness overtake you the one who walks in darkness does not know where he is going while you have the light believe in the light that you may become sons of the light see this is not the time to discuss old testament theology new testament theology no this is the time of opportunity jesus is saying come into the light walk in the light you have been living in darkness all your life now is the opportunity so he had shown them his miracles he had allowed them to hear and understand his messages they had observed and studied carefully his ministry but still they refused to believe in him see they refused to believe in him now the key word of this section from verses uh, uh, 37 right down you know is believe believe the word believe is used eight times in this passage so john is ex, uh, you know uh, the disciple john is actually explaining the unbelief of the people they would not believe see john chapter 12 was 37 and 38 he quotes that passage from isaiah and he says isaiah 53 verse 1 he says lord who has believed what he heard from us and to whom has the arm of the lord been revealed see so the first point he wants to make is that they would not believe the next point comes in verse 39 says now they could not believe see then comes in verse 40 41 they should not believe see all these are quotations from isaiah okay isaiah 53 verse 1 isaiah 6 verses 9 and 10 what is john meaning here see the word of god gives you opportunities to be saved but when you reject that offer then you can't be saved and once you can't be saved then you you know jesus hardens your heart so that you should not believe now you want to keep on going into the darkness jesus allows you to do that god allows you to do that and that's a dangerous condition The example is seen in the Old Testament between Moses and Pharaoh. Moses and Pharaoh grew up in the same uh, privileges. They both uh, grew up in the castle in the in the palace. They had all the privileges that the Pharaoh would get, that the king would get, a prince would get. And once they reached grown-up age, you know, Moses took the choice of being mistreated along with his people, whereas Pharaoh continued in his luxuries. and then comes moses being called to serve god because he chose earlier how to be treated along with the israelites it was easier for moses to conform to what god demanded of him then moses comes face to face with pharaoh and confronts him because pharaoh has been rejecting god all his life when the moment of of choice came pharaoh also resisted god pharaoh resisted god moses surrendered his will to god pharaoh resisted god because pharaoh resisted god the bible says later on because pharaoh hardened his heart first god also hardened pharaoh's heart you see so they would not believe they could not believe and finally they should not believe 
in spite of all the clear evidence that was presented to them, the Jews would not believe. God had shown him through Jesus, you know, great power of his arm. He had done great miracles in front of them. Yet they closed their eyes to the truth. They closed the eyes to the truth. They had heard the message and they had seen the miracles, but they chose not to believe. See, when a person starts to resist the light, something begins to change within that person. He comes to the place where he now cannot believe. See, Everybody can either believe or disbelieve. See, That is a choice that is open to them in the beginning. But when you start resisting the light, what happens? The change comes from inside. That is, we, we cannot believe. We reach a stage where we cannot believe. This is what we call judicial blindness. Okay. God permits this judicial blindness to come over the eyes of people who do not want to believe, who don't take truth seriously. See. Now, this quotation from Isaiah is found in, in, a, in a lot of places in the New Testament. Matthew 13 verses 14 and 15, Mark 4 verse 12, Luke 8 verse 10, Acts 28, 25 to 27 and Romans 11 verse 8. No? What does it talk about? It talks about a group of people who have resisted God. Okay? Who have resisted God. Who chose not to believe. See, You know when God presents us with the truth, it is a serious thing, it's a serious offense to treat the God, truth of God's word lightly. See? Because a person can miss the opportunity of being saved. You know? He can miss the opportunity of being saved. Isaiah 55 and verse 6 says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. If the opportunity is missed, oh, Warn to you because you will not, you may not get that opportunity again. See, so repeatedly, if God is calling you, behooving you, knocking on your heart's door, it is time for you to open the door of your heart and allow Him in. Because you, once you miss this opportunity, you may not get it again. You may not get it again. So, there were those who would not believe. And there were those who would not openly confess Christ even though they had believed him. See, John chapter 12, verse 42 and 43. 42 and 43. Nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him. But for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it. So that they would not be put out of the synagogue. Maybe Nicodemus and Joseph Arimathea were two of those people. You know, They were actually part of the Sanhedrin. But they chose not to confess openly their faith in Jesus. Why? Because they did not want to be put out of the synagogue, you see. They did not want the Pharisees to you know, look down upon them. So they chose to be secret believers. What about them? You know, the Bible says, For they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. They wanted to play it safe. Yeah. So, Maybe, maybe Nicodemus and Joseph, you know, of Arimathea, they wanted to belong to this, this group. But eventually they did come out in the open and they confessed Christ. They took his body from the cross and they put balm on it and embalmed it and put it in the grave. So they made their confession of Christ. But in the early church, there were a great number of Pharisees. Acts chapter 15, you will find them. And priests, Acts chapter 6. They all became Christians, Pharisees and priests. But there was this struggle between the glory of God or the praise of man. The glory of God or the praise of man. There is a tug of war inside us. What do you want and what do I want? See, It's a costly thing no? to get excommunicated from where uh, you have grown up and uh, you know, you, your family is all part of mem you know, membership and all those things. But the secret believers, they want the best of both worlds. They want to be saved. They want the glory of God and they also want the praise of man. Okay. What does John 5 and verse 44 say? 
John 5 and verse 44 tells us like this. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? You can't have the cake and, you know, eat it too, right? You, you can either go, go for the glory of God or you can go, go for the glory of man. If your heart is towards glory of God, then don't be, don't be mindful of the glory that man wants to give you. See? That's what John 5 and verse 44 says. Now, let's understand that this is the last message that Jesus is going to speak to them. Okay, So he's very serious about this. Now, Jesus cried out and said, whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. He was talking about the authority that he is speaking on. He says, my father is speaking to you through me. See. So, again he was emphasizing on faith, faith, faith. God sent the son. To see the son means seeing the father. Jesus is the light of the world. His words are the very words of God. And faith in him brings salvation. To reject him means facing eternal judgment. What is Jesus saying? The very word that I am speaking to you is going to judge you. In his first coming, he did not come to judge us. He came to save us. But then he is going to come again. That time he is going to judge us. So, if you reject the word, the words that you have rejected is going to judge you. That's what Jesus says. You know, it will be very, very unique to see, you know, on the final judgment day, when, when people are going to be judged, they are going to remember all the word of God that they have heard. You know, every bit of the word of God that they have heard and they have stored in their mind will be, all be brought out and say, you heard the word, you heard the word and still you rejected me? Jesus will ask them. See? So the very word that a person rejects will become his judge. Why? Why the word will become his judge? Because the written word points to the living word. The written word points to the living word. Who is the living word? The living word is Jesus himself. John chapter 1 and verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, the glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth, full of grace and truth. See? So many people reject the truth. Why? Because they fear people. Right? Among those who are going to be in hell, they are going to be people who are fearful people. What were they fearful of? Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8. Revelation 21 and verse 8. But as for the cowardly, see, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, and for the murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. What are you fearful of? Are you fearing that man will somehow condemn you and you know put you down or are you afraid that God would condemn you and put you down it is better to be fearing God and going to heaven than to be fearing people and going to hell I'll say it again it is better to fear God and go to heaven than to fear people and go to hell but as for the cowardly no now, last part, verse 44 onwards, you'll find the word judge is repeated four times in this closing message. Okay, Jesus did not come to judge. He came to save us. John chapter 3, verse 18 and John chapter 8, verse 15. But if the sinner will not trust in the Savior, then the Savior must become his judge. If you don't trust Jesus as your savior, the next step is the savior will now become your judge. So, every time a sinner rejects the savior, he is passing judgment on himself or herself. Okay. 
you are not judging the lord you are actually judging yourself every time you reject his word you reject his salvation then you are rejecting you are you are actually judging yourself now as we studied in these 12 chapters the gospel of john we have seen his life we have seen his ministry we have seen his miracles and we have seen his message and we understand that he has this desire to save sinners have you considered the evidence no you have been taking down notes all these classes you've been listening faithfully to the messages have you come to the conviction that jesus christ is indeed the son of god the savior of the world have you trusted him and received everlasting life that's the question that's the most important question and what does jesus remind us while you have the light was 36 while you have the light believe in the light that you may become the sons of light things are going to change opportunity is going to be missed and then you would never become children of light again but when you have the light believe in the light that you may become sons of the light so 12 chapters we have finished and in 12 chapters jesus has communicated all that he wants you to know so that you could make an informed decision on who he is and what he can do for you if you haven't surrendered your will to him if you haven't surrendered your hearts to him if you haven't considered the evidence even now you might miss the opportunity just like how the jews missed their opportunity jesus did not come into public ministry again he went into hiding then he went started teaching only the disciples he did not have any public sermons after this this was the last opportunity that the jews got to be saved they still rejected him sad for them but sad for us if after 12 chapters of john if you haven't committed your heart to christ you have also missed your opportunity so let's not be people who miss the opportunity even today let's give our hearts to him let's surrender our will to him heavenly father we thank you and praise you that you give us opportunity after opportunity to believe in you to know you as our savior and lord help us oh lord not to take it lightly because the opportunity can be missed help us to understand the seriousness of it because if we reject him and we miss the opportunity we are going to be in eternal hell forever and ever and father this evening help us to check our hearts what is god speaking to me today what is the spirit prodding me today would i put my faith in christ would i surrender my will to the father would i love jesus to invade my heart i pray that you would save each one of us help us to consider the evidence and put our faith in you and you alone o oh lord father that we may be saved from eternal hell and we might all become children of god we thank you and we praise you in jesus precious name we pray amen okay all right so i will share the screen and Your grace is enough Your grace is enough Your grace is enough for me Great is your faithfulness O God You wrestle with the sinner's heart You lead us 
by still waters and to my sea. And nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough. Enough for me. Great is your love and justice, God. You use the weak to lead the strong. You lead us in the song of your salvation and all your people sing along so remember your people remember your children remember your promise O oh God you this week.